Clean Disaster on Highway 709 webinar. A couple of things that we're going to go through today. We're going to go through some common mistakes that we've seen on gift tax returns. Uh, it's extremely important this year because of the number of gift tax returns that are going to be filed that we prepare these correctly to help make sure we use the right amount of the lifetime gift exemption available to the clients and that we also provide full and adequate disclosure. What we've also done is at pages 53 through 58 of the PowerPoint, we've provided a checklist. Uh, this is pretty much all the information you're going to need to ask for from a client to prepare the gift tax return for them. And then at pages 59 and 60 of the PowerPoint, I have a fact pattern, uh, which we generated to be able to produce two sample 709s. The sample 709s were also sent to you. Uh, they are separate PDFs. And we'll go through those as well as we're going through the program. So that being said, we'll go ahead and get started. OK, so during 2011, the lifetime gift tax exemption was increased from $1 million to $5 million. That amount was increased to $5,120,000 for 2012. And originally, it was scheduled, if Congress took no additional action, that on January 1, 2013, the lifetime gift exemption would be reduced back to $1 million. Now, I'm sure everyone's aware Congress did act. They've extended the gifting allowance and made it permanent, and it's indexed for inflation, so it's actually increased to $5,250,000. But because there was such uncertainty, and what happened is most of our clients, and if they didn't make gifts in 2011, made gifts in 2012, utilizing this extra $4 million worth of exemption that they had. So because of that, we need to be certain that the gift tax returns that were filed are prepared correctly. And you're going to be filing a lot of gift tax returns this year. So now we're going to touch on what we think are the 10 most common mistakes that we see. Uh, the most important thing the gift tax return can do is to provide adequate disclosure to the Internal Revenue Service. If you don't provide adequate disclosure, then the number one thing that you're preventing is the statute of limitations from running. And typically, the IRS, as we're going to see later, has three years from the filing of a gift tax return to audit the gift. But if they don't have adequate disclosure, then that statute of limitations doesn't run. Second thing that we see is that the client's annual exclusion is not used appropriately to reduce the value of the taxable gifts. Now, when that happens, you're wasting the client's exemption and making it so that instead of possibly having a $100,000 gift being reported at, say, $76,000 if they have $24,000 worth of crummy gifts available, um, you'd report it as 100, wasting that 24,000 that couldn't be used in the future. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute or two. Another thing that we have is not reducing the reportable value of the gifts for gifts that are made for educational or medical exclusions. Again, that's going to waste your exemption. Another item we see commonly is misreporting gifts of 529 plans. Uh, 529 plan gifts can be spread, uh, spread out rapidly over a five-year period. And if you don't do that, then you might be using some exemption that you don't need to. And we're going to touch on that again in a little bit. Another problem we see, uh, and this is something that is pretty common, is assuming that the annual exclusion gift also qualifies for the GST annual exclusion. Uh, and we're going to touch on this in a while. But most times when a gift is made to a trust, if that trust benefits your child and your grandchildren, it's not going to qualify for the GST annual exclusion. So even if you have crummy right of withdrawal powers that reduce the value of the gift, for gift tax purposes, you're still going to need to allocate the full amount for GST purposes. Another item we see is, and it's very simple, but if you make a copy or a gift to a trust, when you actually file the gift tax return, you need to either provide a copy of a trust or a brief description of the trust to provide adequate disclosure. Now, I think it's best practice to go ahead and just provide a copy of the trust, because if you do a brief description, it might be inaccurate. If you provide the copy, you know you satisfy the requirement for adequate disclosure. One other thing that we see quite often is that when you make a gift to a trust, unless it's a trust that's only for the benefit of your grandchildren and more remote descendants, that gift should be reported on Schedule A Part 3. A lot of times we see it being reported on Schedule A Part 2. It's not clear whether that would cause uh, adequate disclosure to not be provided, so just make sure you're reporting it the right way. A couple other things. Um, some preparers try to file a joint tax return. That's not allowed. If you split the gift with your spouse, that's permissible in most situations. Uh, but typically, you and your, your, and your spouse are both going to have to file the gift tax returns to split it. Another thing that we see quite common are mistakes related to gift splitting. Uh, there's a lot of traps for that. We're going to talk about them in a few minutes. And then finally, the other 
item that we see is possibly opting out of the automatic exclusion of GST exemption not being considered. And when the GST, you get automatic allocation, but you have the ability to actually opt out of that. So if when the gift is made, the value was $100, and now the value is only $90 when the gift tax return is going to be filed, you might want to consider opting out of the automatic allocation and then filing a second gift tax return to actually allocate the reduced amount of GST exemption. Save that extra $10 worth of GST exemption, in my example, for your client down the road. All right, so turning to now to the nuts and bolts of the presentation, why does a gift tax return need to be filed and completed correctly? And as we talked about before, if you don't provide adequate disclosure, you don't start the statute of limitations for the IRS's ability to challenge the, the value of the reported gift. And then also you need to make sure you're not wasting the actual available exclusions and then wasting your applicable credit amount for the client. So if you filed the gift tax return correctly three years after filing, you have finality with respect to the value of the gift. You're free to go ahead and do additional planning knowing that the discounts that you took on the gift are actually going to be honored. The applicable credit amount, uh, as we talked about earlier, it had been $1 million. It was increased to $5 million for 2011 and $5,120,000 for 2012. Originally, it was going to be reverting back on December 31st, 2012 to $1 million, and it wasn't actually until January 2nd, 2013 that this extra amount was made permanent and indexed for inflation and increased to $5,250,000. So because of that, I think you're going to see in your practice that you have a lot of gift tax returns to file this year, many more gift tax returns to file than you typically would. Um, now as far as the IRS agents auditing this, uh, you can see with the increased estate tax exemption, there are going to be a lot less, lot less estate tax returns that are going to be filed. So that's going to free up time for them to actually audit the gift tax returns. And that being said, there are going to be a ton of gift tax returns filed in this year and for last year. So if you have one that shows that you filed it you know, correctly, you know what you're doing, it might decrease the actual risk of that being audited simply on its face looking like it's a good return. So the IRS can challenge the value of a reported gift. And as we talked about, uh, if you provide the adequate disclosure and it's three years have passed since the return was filed, then pursuant to Internal Revenue Code 2504C, IRS does not have the ability to come back and audit the return to challenge the value later. So it gives you the finality. Adequate disclosure, uh, to provide that, you need a description of the transferred property, uh, the identity of each transferee and the relationship between the transferor and the transferee. It's something that's often overlooked. And if the gift tax or the gift is made to a trust, you need to include the trust tax identification number and a brief description of the terms of the trust or a copy of the trust instrument. So again, here I like providing a copy of the trust instrument. I also like providing a, the address and identification of the trust, uh, the trustee, just to help provide additional information. Number four, uh, it doesn't happen too often, but you need to include a statement if you take any position that's contrary to proposed temporary or final treasury regulations. So just know it's there. It's not something we see very often in, pra in practice. And then number five, the value of the gift, it needs to be supported by an appraisal, meeting the standards of this treasury regulation. So typically you're going to work with a valuation firm to determine the discount that's applicable to your limited partner interest or your LLC interest that you might have been gifting. You can take discounts for lack of control and you can take discounts for lack of marketability. Uh, if it's a gift of real estate, you want to go, go ahead and get a qualified appraisal of that as well to help document the value. Um, there's also some additional information that you can submit based on the requirements here. The, the best practice really is rather than trying to fill in the blanks and hit the requirements on your own with a tr uh, go ahead and get the actual appraisal done. All right, and now what I'd like to do is just turn for a minute to one of the sample gift tax returns that we have. Which we'll actually get to in one second or two. Okay, I'm having a problem with that for this second. I apologize. Um, documenting the value of the gift, appraisal should be submitted for items that do not have readily determined values. And so if you're dealing with a closely held corporation, you want to go ahead and make sure that you have submit the appraisal for that. If you have other items, um, such as real estate, go ahead and get the appraisal for that as well. 
Something else that should be considered, if you do make a gift of a life insurance policy, you need to submit the, the Form 712 to help document the value of that. And for transfers of closely held corporations, the balance sheet, earnings statement, and dividends received for the five years prior to the gift should be attached. Um, so that's very important to realize as well. All right, and a couple other things to note. Uh, the gift tax return on page 9 of the instructions provides additional information that should be submitted for certain specific items. A couple of other things. When must a gift tax return be filed? Generally, the gift tax return is due by April 15th of the year after the gift was made. And if the taxpayer files a Form 4868 to obtain an extension of his or her personal income tax return, Uh, then they'll automatically receive a six-month extension to file the gift tax return. So now another thing to note is that if the taxpayer is not seeking an extension to file his or her income tax return, then what you can do is file a Form 8892, and you'll get an automatic extension of time to file the gift tax return for an additional six-month period. Okay. One thing to note, it doesn't happen very often, but if you have a donor who actually decided to make a taxable gift, that exceeded his or her exclusion, so that there's actually gift tax payable and due. Uh, that amount needs to be paid on the April 15th. It's a similar rule to what we have in the estate tax world, where in the estate tax, after nine months after date of death, you file the actual return. And when you file it, you can go ahead and, and request the six-month extension to actually file the return to give you 15 months. But when you request that six-month extension, you need to make an estimated payment. So in the event that your gift tax return is actually going to result in a payable amount due, you need to go ahead and make that payment on the 15th. All right. Uh, a couple other things to note is if the donor dies during the year when the gift was made, the gift tax return is due when the estate tax return for the decedent is due. All right. So now that we have our technical difficulties solved, I'm going to go back to the actual sample gift tax returns that we provided. A um, couple of things to note. Are when we do our gifts, most frequently what we do are continuation schedules. Uh, we attach them to the actual gift tax return. And so here in this situation, we've identified who the gift was made to, the relationship of the, donor, of the donee, the address of the donee, and also a description of the gift as well. Uh, and so that's just something I wanted to point out very quickly on the continuation schedules. And the reason we do that is that Schedule A is where you're supposed to be list, listing all of your gifts. There's not very much room in there to provide the information that they request. Uh, so most times what we do is we do the attached continuation schedule, see attached, we carry the total in, sum the totals like you're supposed to, but at least that way it doesn't compress everything onto one page, which is very hard to navigate. All right, so who must file a gift tax return? If a donor does not, a donor does not need to file a gift tax return if one of the following six exceptions applies. One is that if the donor transfers amounts to donees that do not exceed the annual exclusion. So for 2012, if I made gifts and none of my gifts exceeded $13,000 to any one person total for the year, then I don't need to file a gift tax return. Um, one thing to note is if the donor transfers an amount in excess of the annual exclusion and splits the gift with his or her spouse, a gift tax return needs to be filed even if the amount is less than twice the annual exclusion. So if I have $20,000, and I make that gift to my daughter, and I split the gift with my, with my wife, even though it's under $26,000, I still have to file a gift tax return because I made the gift of $20,000. Um, so in that situation, to avoid filing the gift tax return, what you should have done probably is take $7,000, transfer it in the name of, of my wife, and then she can make a $7,000 gift, I can make a $13,000 gift, and no gift tax return would need to be filed. All right, now another thing to note is that in my example that I have down here, uh, which I'm circling here, so in this one I'm saying I make a $25,000 gift to the son. Wife makes no gifts to the, during the year. We split the gift with the wife. The gift tax return needs to be filed by the husband, like I just talked about. Um, but in this situation, because the wife made no additional gifts, she doesn't need to file a separate gift tax return uh, to actually split the gift. All she'll need to do is consent, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Another situation where you're going to need to file a gift tax return um, is if you, or do not need to file a gift tax return is if you're both U.S. citizens and the husband and wife and one of them transfers assets that qualify for the gift tax marital deduction to the other spouse, there's no need to file. 
Another situation is if the donor transfers assets to his or her spouse, the spouse is not a U.S. citizen, and the amount does not exceed $136,000. Now, this was the 2012 dollar amount. It's been increased to $143,000 for 2013. Uh, but if you don't transfer assets in excess of that, then you're okay. Turning to the next slide. Again, this is situations where you do not need to file a gift tax return. If the transfers are payments that qualify for the educational exclusion, or the medical exclusion under Internal Revenue Code 2503E. And to qualify for this, for the educational exclusion, the payment has to be made directly to the qualifying educational organization and must be for tuition. Uh, payments that are for books, supplies, room and board, and other expenses do not constitute direct tuition costs. So it's only the tuition costs that you're paying. And if you pay those, you don't need to file a gift tax return, even if it's in excess of $13,000 or $26,000, it doesn't matter. Similar line for the medical exclusion, it has to be directly to the care provider. And then if you're later for, or if you're later reimbursed by insurance, the reimbursed portion could constitute a gift. It's something to check out in the Treasury reg if you want to look into that further. Another time when you do not need to file a gift tax return is if you're making or transferring assets to political organizations. Right? Now one thing I want to note that's very important is that or not very important, but it's to file your gift tax return correctly, is that if you're dealing in situation four, where you've made an educational exclusion or a medical exclusion, or you're dealing with situation five, where you transfer to, to a political organization, you don't list those gifts on Schedule A, or those transfers on Schedule A of the Form 709. They're just not mentioned on Form 709 at all. It does not need to be included. And so you're going to see later when we get to the sample fact pattern, um, we have John in this situation making a gift uh, to some charities. Now, because it's a gift to charities, it actually would need to be reported. Um, and so we have that here, the Community Foundation showing the gift of $40,000. Now, in this situation, if he had made direct expenses for educational or medical, they wouldn't need, would not need to be reported. But if you do have charitable donations, technically they should be reported on, on Schedule A, Part 1. Um, and then what you do is when you get to Part 4, of Schedule A, and this is on page three of the gift tax return, you're going to see a charitable deduction for items, and you go ahead and you list the actual items. So it's part one, number two, the exclusion, and in this situation it's $20,000. Now the reason it's $20,000 is that in this gift tax return we're splitting it with the spouse. So it's a $40,000 cash gift. You can see that there, the value of the daily gift, $40,000. But when you split the gift, you only report half of the total amount in the columns. So that's why it's a $20,000 gift that's being reported in this situation. All right. Another time that you do not need to file a gift tax return is if it qualifies for the charitable deduction. And either it's a qualified conservation contribution or the transfer is the transfer of your entire interest in the property and the donor has never made a transfer for less than full market value in the property before. So that's not going to require you to file a gift tax return. So by a similar means, if I had no taxable gifts in my, ta in my actual fact pattern and I wasn't required to file a gift tax return, just because I made a gift of $40,000 to charity would not require me to file the gift tax return. It's just simply the fact that if I do have to file a gift tax return, I do need to list those charitable items on there. A couple of things we want to point out, qualifying for the gift tax marital deduction. Gift tax marital deduction is available if First, the spouses need to be married to each other at the time the gift was made. The donee spouse is a U.S. citizen, and the asset transferred to the donor is not a non-deductible terminal interest. If you do transfer an asset that would qualify as a Q-tip property, what you need to make sure you do is you have to file a Q -tip, or file the gift tax return and actually make a Q-tip election. And what's really important to note here is there's no relief for late filing to make that Q-tip election. Now, to make the actual Q-tip election, you go to your gift tax return, and when you file it, you have to check the appropriate box to make the actual gift tax or to make the actual Q-tip election. Uh, so, the special Q-tip election up here, you check the box on Part Two, Page Five. That would allow you to qualify for the Q-tip election. Now again, it's extremely important to note, and most people don't make lifetime Q-tip gifts, but if you're in a situation where you are making a lifetime Q-tip gift, you need to be certain 
that what you've done is actually made the timely filing because if you haven't, you have no relief for late filing. A couple of things on splitting spousal gifts, the requirements. Um, Again, they have to both be U.S. citizens. Both spouses have to consent to have all of the gifts treated as being made one half by each. And also, the spouses must be married on the date of all the gifts made during the year that you're trying to split. And what's significant is you can't remarry during the year. Um, so in the event that you have a divorce, you might want to consider placing that into the actual marital settlement agreement that there'll be no remarrying in the same year because otherwise, you might have made a large taxable gift that you didn't think you were going to do because you're intending on splitting it with your spouse. So if the spouses agree to split the gift, um, what you need to do, and it's pretty simple, is in this situation, what we have right here, what I'm circling, is the information that you need to complete on the gift tax return. So gifts made by husband or wife, if you agree to split it, click yes. You need to provide the social, you need to provide her name, and then you also need to confirm that they were married to each other during the entire calendar year. Uh, and if not, you need to go into this little detail down below. So it's something to be aware of. It's very easy to do. Nothing very technical there at all. One thing that I would like to point out, and the IRS actually suggests this, is if you are splitting gifts, what's probably best is to go ahead and file the actual gift tax returns in the same envelope. It helps the Internal Revenue Service to not get confused. Again, you're just trying to make their life easy and make it so they're not very interested in your return. A um, couple of other mistakes we see is that if the return is filed by one spouse, the consenting spouse has to signify his consent on the return. The consent can't be made after the later of April 15th of the year following when the gifts were made or when the actual gift tax return was filed. So if you file a late gift tax return, you can still consent. But if you've actually filed the gift tax return, and let's say you were early, let's say you filed it in March, we're past April 15th, after April 15th, the spouse cannot consent. Um, and what this is, is, it's important to know that you have to file it correctly. So if you're filing a late one, you have to actually split the gift when you file it. You can't wait for the IRS to come and try and audit you and then say, oh, I, really, I want to split the gift. Right. Another mistake that we see is trying to split a gift where the spouse is a beneficiary of a trust. It is permissible based on the terms of the tr if based on the terms of the trust, the spouse is very unlikely to receive benefits from the trust. You can see the private letter ruling we cited as well as the case. That will give you a good idea. Um, we can set up trusts that benefit the spouse and split the gift for the spouse. But again, you need to make sure that there are significant assets outside the trust so it's very unlikely the spouse will actually be able to ever receive a benefit from the trust. All right, one possible exception to the April 15th deadline to split gifts is, again, if no gift tax return has been filed um, and then also the spouse then elects to split the gift when the actual gift tax return is filed, you can still split it. It's important to note, though, if you do receive a notice of deficiency from the Internal Revenue Service and you have not filed that gift tax return yet and the gift tax return is late, you have lost your ability to split the gift. So if you're planning on splitting the gift, let's make these gift tax returns timely. Number five, a debtor incompetent spouse can actually make the election to split the gift. Uh, the executor for a deceased spouse or the guardian for an incompetent spouse can consent to split a gift made, and one thing that's important to note is the gift has to be made prior to the death of the deceased spouse. So after your spouse dies, you can't split gifts with them. It's logical, but just something to be aware of. Number six, spouses may not remarry during the year, and this is what we touched on in the beginning of this little section. So it's important to note that if you are in a divorce situation, you've made a large taxable gift. Let's say you make that gift on January 1, and then you and your spouse divorce on April 1. If either of you remarry during the remainder of the year, you are no longer eligible to split the gift that you made on January 1. So if you are planning on splitting a gift, and let's say that I made a $9 million gift to a trust for the benefit of our children, my wife and I get divorced, and then she remarries or I remarry during the remainder of the year, instead of having that $9 million gift that was going to be split, which would not result in any gift tax, I'm suddenly subject to gift tax on a $4 million taxable gift. So you might want to consider putting a provision in a marriage settlement agreement related to that. Again, for splitting the gifts, it's an all or nothing situation. There's no picking and choosing. Um, one thing to note too, the election is not necessarily irrevocable. So again, let's say you're that early bird, you file your gift tax return on March 1st, and you elected to split the gift. If you actually file an, an additional rescission before April 15th, you can no longer, you can change your mind and say, I don't want to split the gift. 
Uh, so you have until April 15th to rescind that if you actually did make the gift splitting originally. Right. Um, and then again, as we touched on earlier, sometimes the consenting spouse doesn't have to actually file a gift tax return. That's in situations where no gift exceeds $26,000. They were all made by one spouse and the other spouse didn't make any gifts. Uh, he or she just needs to actually sign on the consent on the first page of the spouse who made the actual gifts, and then you don't need to file a second gift tax return. All right, one thing to note, gift tax annual exclusion, again, it's $13,000, and it's going to be $14,000 for this year. It's important to realize that these only qualify for present interest uh, for the annual gift tax exclusion. So in a situation such as what we have here, where I am showing that John makes a gift to his son, uh, $26,000, it's an outright gift, that's going to qualify for the annual exclusion. Uh, same idea here where I'm showing that John's wife Mary made a gift and they're splitting it, so you have to show it as well on this, uh, to the, their granddaughter outright. That's going to qualify for the annual exclusion. Um, in this situation, the gift that I'm showing to the Doe Descendants Irrevocable Trust does not qualify for the annual exclusion, but the Ruth Anderson Irrevocable Trust was drafted to qualify for the annual exclusion. Now, when you do that to qualify for the annual exclusion, um, you're making what's called a crummy right of withdrawal. So the trust has to provide that the beneficiary has an immediate right to withdraw the assets that are being contributed that are intended to qualify for the annual exclusion. Frequently, that's for a 60-day period. And so long as the trust has that right of withdrawal in it, and ideally the beneficiary should at least know of the contribution and of his or her right to withdraw the assets. Uh, you're not dead in the water if they don't, but it's a good thing to have that. Um, that'll help to qualify those annual exclusion gifts that are made to the trust. Uh, again, now gifts of future interest don't qualify. So a future interest would be something like a remainder or a reversion or anything else. But if you have a gift of a future interest, it's got to be reported at its full value. But when you're using a gift of an annual exclusion, you can actually reduce the value of the gift. So in this situation, what we've got here is it was a $210,000 total gift made to the irrevocable trust. Uh, we have four beneficiaries who each annual exclusion was being used. And so that allows $26,000 worth of annual exclusion gifting per beneficiary. So as a result of that, you have $104,000 worth of annual exclusion gifts. And when we have excess amounts of gifts being reported to a trust, I like to show the $106,000 going to the trust directly. So that's the 210 total, the $106,000 plus the $104,000 of annual exclusion. Um, you can notice again what we've done here is we provide a copy of the trust, and then we also say that each beneficiary listed below has provided a notice of their right of withdrawal, assuming they do. And then for each beneficiary, we're providing the relationship and their address like we need to. Um, now on the actual gift tax return, one thing to note as well is that the annual exclusion gifts, uh, when you report all of your gifts, let me back up one second, when you report all your gifts on Schedule A, uh, the gifts are only subject to gift tax, so these are outright gifts to your children, showing on part one. On part two are direct gifts. These are going to be the gifts that are to your grandchildren or to trusts established for the benefit of only your grandchildren. On part three, we have indirect gifts. These are trusts that are benefiting your children and your grandchildren. And you'll notice that there's a slight variation on where we put the items. Um, for each section, if you're in here, on part one, the top part is where you report the gifts that you made. The bottom part is where you report the gifts that the spouse made. Uh, so that's why you'll see down on part two, my spouse, or in this situation, Mary Doe was the one making the gifts. So you'll see why it's reported on the bottom half of part two. You take the totals from the continuation schedules. You show them as indicated. Total up each of the three parts, one, two, and three. And then you carry the sum of those three numbers over to the next page. That's the total three million one hundred and sixty you have right here. We back out the annual exclusion gifts, which is the total annual exclusions that we've used. So we reduce the amount to three million seventy-three thousand. We back out the twenty million or twenty thousand dollar gift to charity. So the taxable reportable gifts are only three million fifty-three thousand in this situation. So again, it's very important that you know what the annual exclusions are, that you use them correctly, and that you back them out where applicable on Part Four, Schedule Two, to avoid wasting exclusion. All right, now with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom for some discussion of the GST. Thanks, Ken. Ken asked me to deal a little more with the generation skipping transfer tax. Uh, 
Form 709, of course, used to simply be titled the United States Gift Tax Return, but now they have added the United States Gift and Generation Skipping Transfer Tax Return. And um, we find that generation skipping transfers come into play more often than you might think. What I want to do is suggest an analysis that you might go through when you think you're confronted with this issue. I want to keep the in discussion intelligible to the extent that's possible. I'm going to do that by simply referring to children and grandchildren. Now, of course, the GST tax doesn't look at it that way. It looks at skip persons and non-skip persons, and they don't necessarily have to be related to the donor. But we see children and grandchildren so much more than we see anything else. Uh, and the terms skip person and non-skip person are on their face are so difficult to understand that I, again, going to use children and uh, grandchildren. So for non-skip person, just think child. And for skip person, think grandchild. First question you are confronted with is this. Do you have a generation skipping transfer among the gifts that are going on the return? Remember that the concept here, Congress thought that a gift or a state tax should be paid in every generation. So if something goes to grandchildren or their descendants, whether it's outright or in a trust, you've got a generation skipping transfer because by definition, something given directly to the grandchildren is not going to be subject to a gift or a state tax in the child's uh, generation. If something goes to children in a trust, that's not a generation skipping transfer unless it won't be subject to a state tax when the child dies. If the trust is set up to terminate during the child's lifetime with all the assets going to the child, um, that's not a generation skipping transfer. If the trust is set up with the child having a general power of appointment under Section 2041 of the Internal Revenue Code, making the remaining trust assets subject to a state tax at the child's death, you do not have a generation skipping uh, transfer tax. On the other hand, if the trust is set up so that the child will not be subject to tax, there is no general power of appointment, and the trust continues on for grandchildren, then you do have a potential GST situation. And in fact, you have a generation skipping transfer. Well, knowing that you have a generation skipping transfer doesn't totally answer the question, because next you have to ask, what kind do you have? It could be a direct skip or an indirect skip. And to do the gift tax return, it's necessary to know which it is. Well, a direct skip occurs when everything being gifted is definitely going to skip persons, definitely going to grandchildren. Uh, it won't be going to children. So what we are looking at there is first an outright transfer to gr a grandchild or grandchildren. Second, a transfer to a trust, which is only for a grandchild or grandchildren or, or more remote descendants, but you don't have a child in there able to get distributions. Those things are direct skips. They must be listed on Part 2 of Schedule A of the return. And when a direct skip occurs, you're going to find GST tax is due except in these situations. First of all, it might be covered by GST annual exclusion. Not necessarily, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but there may not be enough GST annual exclusion. Second alternative is the donor has GST exemption left and wants to allocate it to avoid paying a GST tax at this point. Uh, and that's usually the case. You don't see a lot of people paying gift tax uh, under the theory, why pay a tax before you have to? So what about an indirect skip? Well, that occurs when the gifted property may later go either to skip persons, grandchildren, or non-skip persons, children. So in these situations, a GST tax may or may not be due 
in the future. Always going to be a situation with a trust, uh, or technically a trust substitute like a life estate, but typically a trust. And you've got a trust here where property could go to a grandchild or a child. For example, the trust could be set up so that the trustee takes care of the child for the child's life and then any remaining assets go to the grandchildren without a power of appointment. No tax, no estate tax for the child, therefore GST tax uh, typically when the child dies. Um, it can also be a trust where the trustee could currently make distributions either to children or grandchildren. In that case, no GST tax when the distribution is made to a child, since the child, of course, is still going to have to pay a gift or estate tax to get rid of that money. But there would be a GST tax payable if a distribution is made to a grandchild. Now, one of the decisions that has to be made when you have an indirect skip is this. You've got GST exemption, and that can be allocated to indirect skips, to trusts which constitute indirect skips. And to the extent it's allocated, that will avoid the GST tax on future distributions to grandchildren. Um, However, sometimes you don't have enough GST tax exemption to cover everything. The recent uh, dramatic increase in the GST exemption has been helpful. Uh, so now people have to be pretty wealthy to have this kind of uh, problem. But if you do not have enough GST exemption, it gets really complicated if a trust is partially exempt and not partially exempt. Um, so really what you want to do from a planning standpoint is have trusts which are fully exempt or not fully exempt. You want to allocate the exemption to part of a trust and not allocate it to another part of a trust. And even if the document doesn't specifically split the trust up this way, the tax laws and Florida law allow the trustee to do this. So you can wind up with an exempt trust and a non-exempt trust. One reason that's helpful is you can go to the exempt trust and from there you can make distributions to grandchildren without worrying about the GST tax. Conversely, if you have the non-exempt trust, that's where you want to pay the children as much as you can. Because uh, otherwise you're looking at GST tax down the road. Oh. As Ken mentioned, the GST law includes some provisions automatically allocating GST exemptions to certain kinds of transfers. And my advice is uh, do what the IRS lets you do. Opt out of that. Or as I put in my notes, don't be lazy, although typically I'm lazy about many things. But in this case, I think it's a good idea to opt out of the automatic allocation and manually do the allocation you want. It makes you think about it. Um, one uh, example Ken and I were talking about is this. You might have two trusts set up for different children eventually going to their, uh, to their children, to the grandchildren. But you might have a child that's in a situation where you can tell there's going to have to be a lot of distributions made to the child. And you may have one where you can tell that the child is not really going to need many distributions. Well then, why just automatically allocate the exemption half to each trust? Why not allocate more exemption to the trust where more is likely to go to the grandchildren eventually? So. Uh, I wish I could say that this was simple and automatic, but unfortunately, it's just one of those annoying things you have to think about. Uh, Ken made the point that the annual exclusion for gift tax, you can get an annual exclusion also for uh, GST transfers, but not for every GST transfer. 
Outright transfers are easy, yes. They qualify for the GST tax annual exclusion. Trusts can, but not, uh, not every trust will do it. There are some requirements. For a transfer to a trust to qualify for the annual GST exclusion, the trust has to be for one beneficiary. So you cannot have a sprinkle trust for 12 grandchildren where the trustee can decide who gets what. You need a trust for one grandchild. The trust terms can't permit distributions to anybody other than that particular beneficiary, that grandchild in my example. And the assets in that trust have to be subject to estate taxes at the grandchild's death, either because the trust is fully distributed to the grandchild before the grandchild dies, or because the grandchild has a general power of appointment under Section 2041, causing an estate tax. The uh, annual exclusion, in other words, will let you beat the GST tax up to the limited extent of uh, 13,000 last year, 14,000 this year, um, but they're not going to let you do it for more than one generation. Uh, you can get it down to your grandchildren, or presumably you could get it to your grandchildren, but it's going to stop there. There's going to be a tax when those people die, if not sooner. The other one says, crummy trust gifts don't usually qualify for the annual exclusion. I just want to make a point uh, on that. Uh, actually, they do with some, uh, depending on who does the crummy trust. One problem with a crummy power is when the crummy beneficiary doesn't take the money out, is that a gift to somebody else? Um, which gets complicated and confusing. One way to deal with that is to leave the money in a trust for that crummy beneficiary and give the crummy beneficiary a general power of appointment over that trust. And you will see this in crummy trusts with some regularity, particularly where if it's an insurance trust or something where there's going to be a lot of gifts being made. Um, that power of appointment, which is put in there to avoid a gift by the crummy beneficiary who doesn't take the money out, is going to help satisfy the GST, uh, the GST requirements for the annual exclusion. So don't assume with a crummy trust you won't get an exclusion. Look at it. And Ken, back to you. That's a great point, Tom. Thank you very much. So Tom mentioned about direct skips and indirect skips. I've got some descriptions in the material about when a trust will be treated as a skip person, uh, indirect skips and GST trusts. The main thing that you need to be aware of when you're reporting these items is that it's going to impact where you actually report them. So if you have a direct skip, which would be a direct gift to your grandchildren or maybe a gift to a trust that qualifies as a direct skip, that's going to be on part two. All your other gifts to trusts are going to be reported on part three. Um, and in our practice, most of the trusts that we see are trusts that are normally going to be reported on part three. All right, one other thing I'd like to mention briefly is reporting gifts to 529 plans. Now, 529 plans don't qualify for the tuition exclusion, uh, but what you can do is you can have them help qualify for, essentially they qualify for the annual exclusion. Um, now, let's say that you make a gift of $65,000 to a tuition plan in one year. Rather than having it be a taxable gift, what you have the ability to do is to spread it out rapidly over five years so that you would be treated as making a $13,000 gift this year, or 2012, and then $13,000 gifts in each of the four subsequent years. Now, in our fact pattern, we've gone ahead and had, uh, a, taxable, or had a 529 plan be funded. And when you do that, you can see here the way that we typically would show it um, is that we show the donor made a gift of the full amount, $130,000, to the qualified 529 plan. Again, make sure you show the name, the beneficiary, or the beneficiary, show the relationship back to the, the donor. And then provide this brief statement that you elect pursuant to 529C2B to have it be made rapidly over a five-year period. Show that 20% of the total is whatever the dollar amount is. In this situation, it's $26,000. And again, we're splitting it with the spouse. So that's why you see the $13,000 there. 
That allows you to make a gift that exceeds the annual exclusion to a 529 for one year, but to not have to use any of your exemption when you actually report the gift. And again, you can spread it out rapidly over five years. Um, one other small thing to note is that when you are making this election on Schedule A, you need to check this box, um, line B of Schedule A, to check yes to make the election to split it rapidly over five years. One other thing while we're here is that if you are reporting a gift of a partnership interest that's been discounted or an LLC interest that's been discounted, you do have to attach the box or click the box yes here explaining what the discount is and what the item is. Uh, not related to the 529s, but it's right there, so I thought I'd mention it briefly. All right, now a couple other things on the 529s. Again, you're going to split it rapidly over the five years, so you report one-fifth of the total. And column E, you list the date of the gift as the calendar year of the gift tax return being filed, not the original date of the gift. So what this means is, let's say in 2013 I file a gift tax return. In 2013, I'm going to go ahead and have to show that I'm still gifting $26,000 worth of assets to that 529 plan. And you list the date of the gift as the calendar year for the gift tax return being filed, though. So you, if I made the gift in the fact pattern here, we made the gift on... September 1st, 2012. When I file my 2013 gift tax return, I would show this again being made in very similar format, but this gift would be made on September 1st, 2013, not on 2012. Um, now, one thing that's important to note is that in 2013, if I did not make any gifts that would otherwise require me to file a gift tax return, I do not need to file a gift tax return just because I have that 529 plan gift that was split over the five-year period. Um, but if I do make other taxable gifts that require the 2013 gift tax return to be filed, I do need to show that I'm still reporting that portion of the 529 plan gift that was made in that year. All right. Um, and again, as I talked about before, charitable donations need to be reported. Um, I explained that earlier. So just briefly, uh, 53 through 58 slides, these are a checklist that will help you make sure you get all the information you need. Um, this is the first is information related to the donor, second information related to the donor spouse, third reportable gifts, and then for certain gifts there's a lot of information that is required, um, and also as far as how you determine the value of the date of the gift. I encourage you to look at the IRS instructions on this to make sure that you're getting all the particular information, but we feel that this checklist will help get you the information you need. Uh, frequently you're going to have to go to the financial planner or some kind of an advisor to get some of the information. Um, a lot of the clients, for instance, don't know the QCIF number of the certain stocks if they made a direct gift of stocks. And then also here on 58, we've got the information required for the trust. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, 59 and 60 are the, the fact patterns. So you can go ahead and take a look at these fact patterns. Um, and we I really only showed you on screen uh, John's gift tax return, but we also provided the sample gift tax return for Mary as well. A couple of things that you'll see um, is in the example, we went ahead and had John make a $500,000 taxable gift in prior years. Um, for Mary, I did not have her make a taxable gift in prior years, just so you can see the difference as far as the calculation of the tax and also how to report that. So if you did make gift tax returns in prior years, um, one thing to note is that you're going to have to check 11A that, yes, you filed it, and then 11B is whether you had a different address. And then when you do Schedule B, this is where you're going to report where you filed your previous returns. Um, so you're going to total that information. This $500,000 represents the total amount of taxable gifts that you made in prior years. That gets imported onto the first page on line two. With that, I think we've covered everything we wanted to do today. Tom, thanks very much for your help with this. My pleasure. And uh, if anybody has any comments or suggestions or has any questions, please feel free to email us. Thanks very much.